Good evening, everyone. My name is Scott Morrell. On behalf of Vanderbilt University and its over 2,300 Memphis area alumni, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight <clears throat> to our showing of the movie Triumph, <clears throat> the untold story of Perry Wallace and our panel discussion on civil rights pioneers. I grew up in North Memphis and I'm a proud graduate of Central High School. After that, I was fortunate enough to attend Vanderbilt University. When I was a freshman, I saw Perry Wallace play basketball. I didn't think much of the fact that he was African American. I just knew he was a good player on a good team. A year ago at another Vanderbilt alumni event in East Memphis, I had the privilege of meeting Mrs. Jesse Wallace Jackson, uh, Perry's sister, whom you all know, I'm sure. She told us some stories about her brother Perry, his triumphs and his struggles in breaking the color barrier of SEC basketball and attending Vanderbilt in the late 1960s. She talked about the movie and the book that had been written about Perry, and we decided it would be a great idea to have a showing of the movie here in Memphis. Many thanks to the Chancellor's Office, the Vanderbilt Alumni Association, and our Memphis chapter presidents, Gavin and Keith, for helping make this evening possible. As I discussed the event with Jesse over the past several months, I became aware that she wanted to tell the story, not just of Perry and uh, his, his struggles and his triumphs, but also the stories of other African American students like him who attended Vanderbilt and other universities and what their experiences were. As a result, our showing of the movie will be followed by a distinguished panel of Memphis area graduates of Vanderbilt, Memphis State, and a legendary Memphis area basketball coach who mentored hundreds of students in high school and college. We hope you enjoy the movie. I'll be back to introduce our panel shortly. Had an undefeated season, and it was 1974, I think. And, um, was an assistant coach at Memphis State, and then was a longtime coach, award-winning coach at Shelby State, which became Southwest Tennessee. We have uh, Dr. Sybil Mitchell, who earned the very first creative writing degree ever awarded at Vanderbilt University. And um, she was there a few years after Perry Wallace. She's gonna share some of that. And uh, Miss Bertha Rogers Looney, member of the Memphis State Eight, um, integrated, Memphis State, and uh, former high school teacher and retired professor also at Southwest. And then we have my dentist, Dr. Derek Payne. I do go to a dentist named Dr. Payne. <laughs> Dr. Payne and I were, uh, we were at Vanderbilt about the same time. Dr. Payne played football, um, also was at Hamilton. And um, I thought I would start in, um, whoever wants to jump right in, but I'd like to hear everyone's impressions. And I'm very, I'm curious, sort of reflected through your own experiences, um, having been put in that position of um, kind of representing something larger than, than just yourself, sort of that, that experience that we just watched, um, that Perry Wallace, really in, in some ways a burden, in some ways, you know, an opportunity. What what would you say about that? I'll start first um, by being a former athlete at Van. It's my first time seeing the uh, the movie, and it was you know very moving. But of course, it 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 dawned on me that a person like Perry Wallace actually gave me the opportunity to be able to go to a college, you know, like a Vanderbilt University. Even though you know I was a pretty good athlete at Hamilton High School, and you know could, probably could have went anywhere in the country that I wanted, but it was a person like Perry Wallace that enabled me to. Uh, he opened doors for athletes like myself, as well as athletes all over the country, to be able to experience, you know, even playing football at a, play, at a, play, at a place like Vanderbilt. So, I mean, I was a little choked up watching it. Because, you know, at Van, I really didn't have to go through what he had to go through. Because during, you know, when I, when I got there in 88, you know, it really wasn't that kind of, kind of hatred going on. At least we didn't know it was going on. Had a lot of uh, white players on my football team, and we were like family. You know, as well as other black guys that came in with me. Me being from South Memphis, 
<laughs> Zach, I didn't know you from North Memphis. I'd have known that, man. We could have really did what we needed to do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, being from South Memphis, a young man, being able to have an opportunity to go to Vanderbilt, it was really uh, a blessing. You know, my mom just dropped me off. You know, I tell people uh, at that time, Vanderbilt was probably like $25,000 a year to go to. And at that time, my mom, I saw her tax return one time. She made $13,000 a year as a waitress. So there's no way I would have been able to go to Vandy, you know, without being on a football scholarship. So she just told me to go ahead and, and do what you've been doing. Stay on top of your books, treat people nice, and try to be the very best person that you can. So it was a blessing. And didn't win a lot of football games there. I was on my way. <laughs> it's crazy. On my way, on my way here, I was looking. I said, "Let me pull up our record just to see where we've been." And man, it was a terrible, terrible <laughs> thing. But one thing that I did Beat on didn't, miss. didn't get a whole lot of wins, but I, I met some great friends. We're still best friends. That was just some of the highlights, you know, of my career at Vandy. So, I mean, it's just a great. I'm just, I'm just blessed to be able to have an opportunity to go there. Thanks, Dr. Payne. Yes, he'll, he'll tell you, catch him after, he'll tell you about the time as our old friend from, also from Raleigh, Carlos Thomas, uh, started a little something up down at Ole Miss. Um, Miss Looney, you know, I found an article where um, it talks about that you would lay, that you would reveal that it was, you know, a little bit of a lonely and isolated time um, for, for you and some of those students. W would you mind? Kind of reflecting on that. Yes, thank you, and good evening to everyone. It, I'm honored to be here, and thanks to Mrs. Jackson for having asked me to come. Although I did not have a chance to meet Perry Wallace, it seems I know him through his sister, Mrs. Jackson, who came to Hamilton the year that I was a senior. And some having gone to Memphis State, then University of Memphis, now about 10 years before he did, I felt that loneliness that's discussed in that. Them, and it became very emotional for me that the isolation, that we were just there and not there, the eight of us. And we would go to the classroom, the others would move their chairs away from us. We were escorted to our classroom by a plainclothes policeman and we have to be off campus by 12 o'clock. We could not go to the cafeteria or to the student union. We could only go to the library if we were going with our professors. And those things that were talked about with Perry, although I didn't pay athlete, that I was not an athletic person, but felt some of the loneliness that was experienced in that film that I just saw. I, um, it was not my choice to go to Memphis State. I was asked by the principal, Mr. Harry Cash, to take the test to see if I could get into the school. My mind was set on going to Fisk at that time. I had a scholarship there, but because my father could not afford the expenses of travel between Memphis and Nashville, I had decided that I would go to Lamont. I had a scholarship there also, but I wanted to go to Fisk and marry a doctor from Harry, but it just didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, after having, I took the test in July of 1959, still set on going to Lamont. And my principal would not let, let me just call my house. The Mr. Jesse Turner would call and say, you must give it a try. So in September of 1959, seven other African-American students and I began classes there at Memphis State. But I must say it was very difficult. Hampton had prepared me for college, but I found out when I got to Memphis State, I was not as prepared as I thought that I was. But I persevered and I can, look back now and see some of the many changes have taken place over the years, whereas we have to leave, we left campus at 12 o'clock. Years later, my granddaughter went and she told me that she started classes after 12 o'clock. But <laughs> 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 many changes have taken place and I'm happy to see the changes that have taken place with various deans that are there, students in all type of leadership at the university. Uh, and I'm just very happy for that. But I experienced that loneliness, but I'm happy for the experience. Do Dr. Mitchell, well, I'm curious what the atmosphere was like by the time you, you, got, to, you got to West End and um, what, the, what, what, what were your feelings kind of watching the documentary? Um, I guess we all have the kinds of um, uh, there's a certain way that we feel when we look at those images of people filled with hatred and 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 dogs and 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 
uh, water hoses and, and just all of those images. Um, I have gained a new uh, respect. I, I've been hearing uh, Jesse talk about Perry, I guess, for years, decades, and to actually see his story. Um, when, when I was at Vanderbilt, um, the, I did earn the first uh, creative writing degree ever awarded by the university. But the English, uh, the director of the English department uh, encouraged me not to pursue that. Uh, he said in class, in front of everybody, that um, my brain was not as large as white students' brains, and it wasn't my fault that black people's brains weren't developed uh, like other brains were, and that he would encourage me not to pursue a degree um, in writing, because it, I just would not be able to complete it. And so that um, motivated me. I not only earned it, and, and I know the Lord helped me, but um, I earned that degree, and I did it in three years instead of four. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always wanted um, Franklin Sullivan, Frank Sullivan, I always wanted him to be proud of me. I always wanted him to praise my work the way that he did other students, but it would never happen for me. Um, I even tried to look him up like years later when I was uh, a news and magazine writer and editor. I was in Florida, and I, I wanted to just talk to him and say, I did it. I, but that never happened, I think, by the time I was um, trying to contact him, uh, he had passed away. But um, I, I didn't encounter the, the level of racism um, there at Vanderbilt. It was more subtle. But he was Frank Sullivan. He was my motivation. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, Coach Sells, um, I, I'm curious if you would you know, they didn't in the film did not go into it as much from having and if you haven't read the book Strong Inside by my friend Andrew Mariners, Andrew was actually my first editor at the Vanderbilt Hustler when I showed up. Um, I encourage you to do that. He spends a decent amount of time talking about um, that decision Perry Wallace had to make. Does he stay in Nashville? Does he go somewhere else? And kind of the, the different pressures and, and things at stake. And um, I was once privileged to write a column at the Commercial Appeal. Um, Miss Jackson, Perry's sister, um, found out again through Andrew's book that uh, Perry actually came to Memphis and a moment of, in history happened. He um, came to Memphis to get Miss Jackson and her husband's uh, blessing to go to Vanderbilt. He made his decision, but he wanted to make sure they knew. And um, because a lot of folks had been encouraging him. Um, you know, you don't need to be a pioneer. You can, you know, go somewhere else. And um, he actually made the call to Coach Skinner from uh, Miss Jackson's house here in Memphis to commit to Vanderbilt. And I bring all that up, Coach Sales, because I know you were pretty close with Larry Finch and Ronnie Robinson when you were assistant coach at, at Memphis. Um, I'd be curious to know, um, did, you, did you think about, you know, sort of the pressure that that they faced, and um, they obviously um, were sort of representing something larger than themselves. They made that decision to represent something larger than themselves as well. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. And good, af good afternoon. I never thought I'd be sitting at a Vanderbilt. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I was that smart. <laughs> uh, at the beginning of the, at, during the, the movie, it almost brought tears to my eyes. Uh, I actually have gone through what Mr. Wallace went through. I was the first full-time assistant basketball coach at a major university in the South. When I came to 
Memphis State University in 1974. There were some black assistants, there were some black coaches, let's put it, no, that's not the term. There were some black recruiters working at SEC schools, but they weren't coaching. They were just there to recruit players. So I was the first full-time. As I traveled around the country, and mostly SEC territory and other places, I got a chance to talk to those, most of those gentlemen. And after a year or two, a lot of them went to their supervisors and said, look, I want to do more than just bring players in. And as you can, as you look around now, you can see what, at what that was, what, and I had, and believe you me, Mr. Wallace, what he went through was unique. And let me first say, had he not been as academically gifted as he was, he probably would not near, have been nearly as, as successful as he was. Uh, he had to endure a whole lot of things that I had gone through. I'll give you, and I'm going to get to Larry no, in a minute. I love it, I love it. <laughs> My first year at Memphis, just to give you several, just an example, I was recruiting a young man out of Vidalia, Louisiana. And got to know the family real well, got close to the family. And the second or third time I had gone down there, they told me, now look, coach, you can go the back way through Jackson, Mississippi, and you'll cut off about 20 miles, and you'll get home quicker. I thought that sounded great. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the back way. It was a it was a highway, but you know, for that full to all that, I don't know how many miles. There were no lights. I I met two cars on the expressway, and you know when you're alone, when you're alone by yourself, going the back way, and you don't see anybody. Your mind plays tricks on you. <laughs> what if my car has a blowout? Somebody might, you know, <laughs> do whatever and nobody will ever never see me anymore. Those were the kind of experiences and I can go on and on, but I'm not. Larry Finch and, <laughs> you know, uh, my girlfriend at the time, she's my wife now. <laughs> One night, uh, some people came up, and I don't know who they were, and they shook hands with Larry. And, and I guess they put some money in his hand. <laughs> and my wife said, did you see that? I mean, my girlfriend, did, but my wife, did you see that? And I said, see what? She said, they actually put some money. I said, don't believe your lying eyes. <laughs> but when Larry decided to, well, during the recruiting process, Larry had a lot of offers just like Mr. Wallace had. But Larry wanted to stay home. And if you know the history of, of Memphis basketball, Melrose High School, Bobby Smith, one of the greatest players to come out of this town, signed with Memphis State at the time, a couple of years before Larry. And the university waited until about a week before school started and told him they couldn't get him in. And of course, you know, that didn't set well. Melrose is a, uh, Orange Mound back then was a tremendous community, it still is. Uh, and that didn't set well with the, with the Melrose community. So now here comes Larry and Ronnie. And Larry actually wanted to go to Memphis and uh, Coach Mo Iver was the coach. And 
Coach William Collins was the, was the head coach. He, he said from day one, I'm not, I don't condone Memphis. I'm not, if you sign, I'm not going out there. For, you know, I'm not going to the press. I'm not doing anything. I don't want you to go there. And so where does the pressure fall? It falls on me. Larry decided, he came to me and he said, Coach, what do you think? And I said, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to go to Memphis. I said, what's your mom want? She, she wants what's, what's best for me, but I know deep down she wants to see me play. I said, okay. So I go to Coach Iba, and at the time, they played real slow out to Memphis. I mean, 50 points was about, that was about it. <laughs> And at Melrose, we, 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 we play like you see them playing now. Mm -hmm. And I talked to Coach Ivan, and I said, Coach, if Larry wants to come, but he can't play in this kind of system, and he promised me that he would, he would change his system, well, that wasn't good enough for Larry. Larry said, Coach, I'm not going out there without somebody, some support, as you saw with Mr. Wallace. So he decided that he was going to bring Ronnie along. Well, Coach Iva didn't think Ronnie was good enough. And, and so I, I convinced him that he was. They both signed out there, but here's what I had to do. Larry said, Coach, and I don't know what he thought I was. He said, Coach, if anything happens out there bad, I want you to promise me that you'll come out there and straighten it out. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Larry, I do the, no, Coach, you, will, you got to promise. So I had to promise that, he, that if anything really went wrong, that I'd come out there and help get it straight. People do not know this to this day. Larry never signed a conference. He never signed a national letter. He only signed the conference letter. He didn't. He didn't have a whole lot of faith in in the in the system at that time. the The, the good thing about all that was, Coach Iba left. Coach Bartow comes in, and he had an entirely different system, and. Uh, and, 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 and I guess he, he knew he had to develop a relationship with me. He didn't have to, but he did. And you see what happened as a result of, of that. Thing. But they went through some things. Uh, if, you, if you recall, Johnny Newman signed with Ole Miss. We thought, and we had all, all of us had a relationship with Johnny. We thought that Johnny was going out there to play with Larry and run. And Johnny had a new, he had another plan. <laughs> he wanted to be the star, which he turned out to be. But it was a, it was a, it was a hectic time then. But the thing about it, you've got to have some support. And Mr. Wallace, obviously his sister and his family, uh, and I'm sure his coaches and all, you have to have somebody that will support you because it's, it's lonely. It's lonely. I, I was going to, I'd like to build on that, and I'd be curious to hear from Miss Looney and anybody else that might want to. The, I was really struck by the statement from the manager who was saying, he, you know, that moment when he could have gone and made that decision, and, and you really heard. Uh, Perry Wallace talking about being in that locker room, Bob. If just somebody would have acknowledged it, I'm. I like to think about what, what lessons can we apply to now for us um, to be what I think folks we kind of now call upstanders and, and what I'd be curious in your experience, um, what, what, you, what wisdom you could share. Oh, that loneliness, having, well there are eight of us, we would be on campus just before eight o'clock. Our classes began at eight, we had to be off campus by noon and no interaction with the other students. We're exempt from all physical education courses because the deans told us that any interaction with the other students could cause some friction. It would be best that we left campus at, at 12 o'clock. 
and we were not in any class with any other people that looked like me. I would see them on the way to class and see them at 12 o'clock. That uh, feeling of not being in a college setting just there because, and knowing that not only did the students not want us there, but the faculty did not want us there either. I, if I would raise my hand, I was just ignored. But the comforting thing was that support that I would receive in the neighborhood from my church and from the principal over at Hamilton High School, that helped me to, um, to keep moving. And I could go to Lemoyne College, which became really my college, where I enjoyed the activities. I was just at Memphis State or University of Memphis at that time. But one of the things that was so frustrating is that when I would go into the classroom, escorted there by a plain clothes policeman, if the, the students that would be near me, they would move their chairs over, so I'm there by myself. But in the uh, lounge, there was one for the women, one for the men, that one-on-one, -on -one, some of the white students would talk to us, but when their friends came around, they would not say anything to us. And the first year went by with very few incidents. We didn't have that physical incident they had over at Little Rock two years prior to that, but we had that mental anguish of students the chant and the uh, people riding around the campus with the Confederate flags out of the cars and people coming over in the neighborhood where I lived. And I, we had a very closely knitted neighborhood. My father his friends would stand guard for us at night so we could go to sleep and all those type of things that created a lot of fear within us. Well, after the first year, a couple of the students left, but others came. They came from Melrose, Coach. <laughs> they allowed them to come from Melrose. Even that first crowd, there were not any students from Melrose. There was three from Hamilton, two from Manassas, two from Douglas, and one from Booker T. Washington. But the second year, Melrose was well represented. But I, <laughs> I must say that the, after that first day, I just thought, well, what did I get myself into? Why didn't I go on to Lemoyne like I had a scholarship and really enjoy college? And I told my father that I did not want to go back to school. That was on a Friday, the very first day of class. And he said, well, you got us into this. You have to go back. Your mother has lost her jobs as a, as a maid for three families. I'm about to lose my job, so you have to go on back there. But it, it, it was difficult. And, uh, but I persevered, and I, uh, I'm just thankful that I did. But it was, it was lonely, lonely, very lonely. Just think about uh, those of us who have really read and, and kept up with sports. Think about what Jackie Robinson had to have gone through uh, when he was in, and when he was the first black player to play in the major leagues. And Branch Rickey told him, in essence, what 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 you what. What basically what you had to go through. Uh, you can't do this. You can't. You got to. What if what if they what if they do? You got to take it. And for three years he took it. And and his wife in in, in one of the books that I've read uh, said basically she thought he was going to explode. And and he didn't live. Jackie, I think he might have lived 60 some, 60 years maybe. Uh, but, and I can't say, nobody can say what killed anybody. But that pressure that you have to keep within yourself certainly didn't help anything. I want to be um, respectful of time. Is any, I thought I might see if there's any questions, um, if anybody in the audience wanted to. No, no, no. Dr. Mitchell, do you, 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 any wisdom that, that you're, you're holding inside you want to share with us? <laughs> let, me, let me say something about it. Vanderbilt was apparently pretty good back then. 1968, they beat Duke and North Carolina. They did. And I'll tell you, and I'll tell you a story that you'll find out in the book that the, it's conventionally thought that the dunk was banned because of Kareem Ab Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but um, Perry Wallace, as a freshman, dunked on the Kentucky team many, many times, and Adolph Rupp took notice, and and he so he he was part of why. 
I'm sorry, did you have a, qu you, a question? No. <laughs> I'm just filibustering. Just make a comment. Sorry, no, that's good. Somebody back here. Dr. Mitchell, I thought. Um, again, back to the film. I, I think that uh, the film is kind of a, a microcosm of, of life, right? And so I, I wonder, um, I guess the, you guys grew up in um, the 50s, 60s, like that. I often wonder what goes through your minds when you look at those same images. Um, well, how I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. So when I see these, I, I wasn't aware of it when I was growing up. I really wasn't. People, those of you who grew up in the South, uh, particularly in the southeast, um, don't you? I mean, when you when you see images of um, lynchings and people, you know, they used to sell postcards like that, and so my mind went back to that seeing these postcards of people posing and, and grinning uh, by a, a lynched by. I mean, I was aware of the civil rights. I was aware of the civil rights movement, and my family. We really followed Dr. King and believed in, in what he believed. But uh, growing up, uh, just the society in Pittsburgh, I was not aware of racial inequality at all. And uh, it, it, it's shocking to see. I mean. Um, I guess when I watched the Civil War series by Ken Burns, that really relations, and I was very naive, uh, but I'm very aware now, so. I really wanted to commend um, you guys for, um, well, the fact that you're here, you know, tonight. Um, just no, well, yeah, so. you, you guys have lived it. I mean, uh, you know, you've, you've lived the prejudice and I wish it would just disappear, but you know we've made great improvements. And, we but. have made great improvements, but I often think that we were, all of us, black and white, we were products of our time, weren't we? We were, maybe some of your parents maybe tried to pass down some ideas maybe that you, you don't believe in today, but we were all on both sides. We were products of our time. And um, I just kind of, well, tonight is just, a, tonight is a triumph, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I will say, I mean, I will say, you know, I, I grew up in Fraser and, and I grew up at a time when um, there was some, definitely some toxic racism that I grew up with and watching this movie, you know, a big influence on me was through sports. To be, to be quite honest and candid, and um, and helping, helping you see a broader world, a broader world view, and um, you know, and I'm I'm grateful for some of the, some of the heroes I grew up watching who were of you know a different race and helped helped enlighten me. And um, I was kind of curious, Dr. Payne. <laughs> Did it take you, I mean, Vanderbilt was a totally different place when you, from from South Memphis and Hamilton. Um, yeah, totally Did different. you, I mean, you're such a, you, you folks get, a, you, you have such a charisma and you get along and folks get along with you, but what, what was that like for you walking into that whole new world? It was definitely a totally different place. You know, me going with no car to versus me seeing some of my classmates driving Mercedes and BMWs. I thought I remember. I remember thinking. I mean, I did. I remember thinking, boy, these professors here sure make a lot of money. And a friend of mine said, those aren't professors' cars. <laughs> if if I remember right, my, one of my best friends, Derek Gregg, he's the uh, athletic director at Tulsa now. But he told he tell in his book that uh, a few of us kind of came together and wrote. We all played football at Vanderbilt together, but he talked about how we actually went to school with Ross Perot's daughter. So, you know, plenty of us was on 
financial aid. We were happy to get our Pell Grants, but I'm pretty sure she probably went straight with a $25,000 check and, <laughs> and paid it. So, you know, those are the types of things. But, but what I, and I, I always kind of said to myself, but I've never just said it out publicly. You know, I'm, I'm grateful that I was able to go to Vandy to be able to get a, a strong education like that. I'm grateful for my best friends who were able to do the same thing. But what I also, also think about is just, I know a lot of young men like myself who grew up in Memphis, who grew up in whatever, but they wasn't given the opportunity to go to a school like Vandy. You know, and I'm just throwing these things out, you know, certain things like ACT scores, you know, keeping them, they were great athletes, but just because we couldn't, you know, couldn't study the same way that our counterpart. So I think about the young people, probably could have been thousands of more and more young men like myself who if we didn't have certain things that kept us from being able to go to a school like Vanderbilt could have achieved. And I'm one of them. I'm, I'm not gonna even tell y'all what my GPA was my first semester. <laughs> and not only that, the, all of these young guys, we didn't have no 2.0s, we didn't have no 3.0s, but just by having the opportunity and being able to go into that environment, we learned how to study. Perry Wallace had to do it by himself, but we had to kind of come together to motivate each other, to encourage each other. Man, you need to get up, you need to go to class. And you know, and I'm just talking about you know, our crew. Out of all of us, we have professors, we have Dennis and myself, stockbrokers, we have per people who are clearing civilian, is the president of McLaren Hospital in Michigan. Oscar Malone is a real estate attorney. Ace, uh, Anthony Carter played with me. He's one of the guys who, if you got cable, chances are he trained the guys to put your cable where you know you had all the different wires. So I just think about the young men and the young, not only young uh, young men, but the young women who, if we had given an opportunity, all we need is just an opportunity. And I'm just a, a living example that through God's grace, if you give us an opportunity, you know, we can do it. And I know, you know, not saying that, that uh, a lot of these things we could have controlled at our own, but I just think about the Cedric Loss that played with me at Hamilton. If he was given the opportunity just to learn how to study, he probably could have graduated from Vanderbilt just like myself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm grateful for it, but also in my mind, I also think about the young people who could have probably still uh, achieved those same things that could have had the same success as the dentist that I'm having, you know. So I'm just grateful for the opportunity, but I also think about that at the same time. That's great. Thanks, Derek. <laughs> we're, we're about uh, 750. That, Coach Tells, you look like you, you had something on your mind. You want to you close this out? Let me say this. The night that Dr. King was assassinated, I was playing with People's University Shops team. You know, you remember Mr. Peoples, and, mm. and we were on our way to Lexington, Tennessee, to play a, a game. And Rich Jones was supposed mm. to be playing, but he didn't go that night. So the all uh, the other guys, I think if there were seven of us. Rich Jones played at Leicester, right? Yes, he played at Leicester, and went on to play in the NBA. He had to sit out when he came mm -hmm. back from Illinois. Uh, he set out that year, and then he played his last year at Memphis. But anyway, that was, that was his sit-out year. And we are on our way to Lexington, Tennessee, when we got the news that Dr. King had been assassinated. I was the only black there. I was the only African-American on, on the team at that time. As I said, Richard didn't go. So we call up, the other guys call up and said, look, we are almost here, but we know we can't play. So we are going to cancel and we are coming back, we're going back to Memphis. As we got on the outskirts of town, the guys, the rest of the guys, called the highway patrol and they said, look, we are, all of us stay in East Memphis is there a way in which we can get home? Yes, there's no curfew in East Memphis. We've got one guy who stays in North Memphis. <laughs> he will never be able to get home, not, not, through, not through this because the curfew is there. So I'm stuck really, uh, and just to show you integration and how uh, 
interpersonal relationships go, which is what we need to be doing now. The guys to decide it, which one of us is going to let this man stay with us tonight so that he can, and they were lifting the curfew at five in the morning and I could go home and shower and go to work. One of the guys decided that he that I would he would let me stay there. And this guy stays in California now. We still get together about every two or three months. There's five or six or seven of us, and we sit down and eat lunch and talk to each other. And, and in fact, we did it about last month. One, it just goes to show you if we get to know each other if we trust each other, if we do the right thing with each other, everything will work out all right. The bottom line is we sometimes we, we are so busy running from each other that we don't get a chance to meet and greet and find out whether we can help each other or not. Because look, we are all brothers and sisters of God. God is the leader. He's the, he's the shepherd and we are the sheep. And when somehow or the other, when we all get that in our heads, we're going to be a whole lot better off. Because what? Well, I think we're going to finish it on that beautiful note. Thank you, Coach Sales. I, and I appreciate you wearing your Vanderbilt colors tonight. Can we, we, can we get an honorary degree for Coach Sales maybe after that? Scott, you want to finish up? I want to thank the panel, Dr. Payne, Mrs. Looney, Dr. Mitchell, Coach Sales. Thank you so much for, we'll, we'll make you an honorary Vanderbilt graduate. I love that. <laughs> tonight only. It expires tomorrow at 5 a.m. <laughs> And I particularly want to th thank our moderator, Zach McMillan. Today is Zach's birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday, Zach. And we hope to see you again at the next Vanderbilt alumni event. Good night, everyone.